Well, thanks to you all for being here. Welcome to Connected Data. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about Transporter, uh, which is the product we make and sell. Uh, you all have a Transporter on the table in front of you, so you have one up close and personal. Um, so, Transporter. Well, in order to talk about Transporter, what I want to do is just start by talking about the cloud market and, uh, and what we see happening there. And it'll be interesting to see whether you guys agree. Certainly, uh, what I'm going to say here was seen as very controversial when we started the business back in uh, the beginning of 2012. But these days, I don't think so much of it seems as controversial as it used to. So cloud storage, what's happening? Well, uh, it really got kicked off by Dropbox. Uh, they invented a whole new way for users to interact with file data, which was super compelling. And I'll talk a little bit about the details around that in a little bit here. But it was so compelling that the cloud services companies, Dropbox and the people who've emulated the way that it deals with files, at this point have a combined user base of over 400 million people, estimated. So super compelling. Lots and lots of people use these services. However, there are a number of issues with cloud storage that we see. Um, first off are the economics of the cloud storage market, which still very much need to be proven. Uh, at this point, it's estimated that 97% of people using cloud services aren't paying for the cloud services. And even for companies that have uh, done a good job of you know, monetizing their user base like Box, the costs are extraordinary. Box obviously the first high profile IPO in the market. And uh, if you saw actually the news is very timely, uh, the stock dropped 15% uh, this morning uh, on the basis of widening losses at that company. Currently, it's burning about $200 million annually on $250 million in revenue, which is quite, quite extraordinary. So it's, it's still a market where the companies that are in it still have to work out an economic model that's sustainable for the long term. I don't think we've seen any evidence that that's the case. Um, you've got these uh, front-end companies losing money. And also, there was a British analyst firm recently that estimated that Amazon Web Services, which is the back-end for many of these storage companies, is itself losing between 2 and $3 billion annually. Uh, so the stack-up of losses through the cloud market at the moment is just staggering. And something has to change there for the long term. And it doesn't seem to us, at least, like the economics of this market are going to get much better with Google and Microsoft entering the market, able to amortize the service against other services they offer, and thus you know, further commoditize this part of the market. The other issues we see with the current cloud storage market uh, you know, have been just you know, all of the news stories that you guys will have seen over the last 12 months. Um, and they've been pretty brutal uh, for the most part. Um, there was an incident you know, towards the end of last year where Dropbox lost tens of thousands of user files irrevocably, deleted off their servers, and then uh, deleted off the user devices through synchronization, no backup, no ability to recover. Um, all sorts of privacy and security issues. Um, uh, you know, I remember again when we started in 2012, you know, one of our assertions was how safe is your data? It's in the hands of somebody else. And the feedback we'd get for the most part was nobody would look at the data, you know, professionals. And then you have stories about you know, the NSA posting up your uh, you, you know, pictures, naked pictures of people around the offices and looking at those. And at the point at which you know, the security services are doing it, I think people sort of think about what might be happening at companies that are hosting their data for them too. Um, all sorts of high profile break-ins. You know, a lot of these cloud companies are like honeypots, where you know, if you can penetrate, um, then there's a lot to access. The Jennifer Lawrence incident from last year was another obviously high profile incident. So you've got the economics, you've got the privacy issues, security issues, and outside of the US, uh, you know, in Europe and the rest of the world, um, you know, governments are at this point passing legislation to try and you know, keep data secure, um, with countries like Canada, Germany, Japan, Russia, China, enacting locality uh, legislation against data for the first time in history. So data actually has to be stored in certain you know, within certain geographical boundaries. So a lot of challenges for the cloud. One thing that we have in the deck that I don't really need to tell you guys about because this is your area of expertise, but uh, you know, here in Silicon Valley, a lot of the conversations I have, you'd think that all storage had moved to the cloud already, and you know, anybody buying hardware at this point was, uh, you know, was really stuck in a sort of legacy uh, mindset. But actually, of course, that's not even remotely true. Despite the fact that cloud companies like Box have a you know, market cap of $3 billion, Dropbox is raising money privately at $10 billion of value, the estimate, our estimate at least, you can have your own, I guess, for the total TAM for the whole cloud storage market from all the vendors is about $500 million. So, you know, relatively small 
given the value and the expectations that are based around that market. Yet, if you look at the hardware piece of the market, obviously that's when the majority of the revenue is. It's the majority of what people are buying today, um, and we believe we'll continue to buy. And even you know, up and comers, you know, new uh, public companies like Nimble or Barracuda, you know, showing great traction. You know, Nimble itself, uh, you know, younger than Box, but yet uh, you know, great IPO and 150 million and a, a revenue profile that makes a lot more sense for the long term. So hardware companies still doing very well. However, you know, whatever uh, you, know, you say about uh, the economics of privacy characteristics of cloud storage, the one thing you've got to admit is that Dropbox has completely changed the way that users interact with files, and I think forever. You know, prior to Dropbox, the way we interacted with shared data um, you know, was very different. We had map drives on servers that had a single file view. Every, it's the same for everybody. If you wanted to go find something on the file server, somebody would have to tell you where it is. Startup after startup, you know, try to tackle the indexing problem and categorize data, and nobody, to the best of my knowledge, was ever successful at uh, at pulling that off. It's a huge challenge. So, you know, the single file system view that was very difficult. If you want to access files remotely, because SIFS and NFS, which were the two key protocols. Um, you know, just weren't designed for wide area access. You'd have VPN tunneling back to uh, the corporation. Even on your mobile phone, you'd be trying to make a VPN work. And it was, you know, it was very hard to make these things work. So what Dropbox did was they completely changed the world, you know, in several different ways. I just listed up four of them here. Um, and like the number one thing for me, which you sort of never really hear anybody talk about, but to me is probably the key invention in what Dropbox did, is the fact that they let everybody organize their own view of shared data. Right? Again, you sort of hear about sync, you know, you hear about links and things, but nobody really talks about that, but it's huge, right? Two people can share a folder, they can call it completely different things, which contextually write for them, and they can put it in two completely different places on their hard drive. So, you know, you guys can, you know, you know, I can share a folder with you, you can put it in your connected data folder, I can put it in my tech field day folder, but it's the same data being shared by, you know, two or more completely different people. And that just, did, there was no way to do that before. That was a completely new invention as part of this. They the, popularized... Sorry, Jeff, I was going to say the only problem with that was that you could also delete somebody else's files very easily. No, you could. And that was a, was a, real, a real issue. No, no, well, a, well, absolutely. Although you could on a file server, right? Yeah, you it's could, the same. Yeah. You know, any kind of shared data has but this. It, but if you, weren't, if you weren't aware where you'd borrowed that data from... Yep. So Stephen shares a lot of the links for these events. And um, I've seen one that he'd shared where somebody else deleted all of the photos because they'd either thought they'd d copied them somewhere else or whatever, and it deleted them on all of ours. Everybody started seeing that happen. Right. And it was really quite a bizarre thing. And, obviously, you know, he recovered it, but if it you don't know the links... It was a constant problem for Dropbox, I think. You know, people mm. dragging things out of the folder and they get, you know, vanish. Yep. So the, the sort of, you know, jumping ahead, that's sort of point four, which is anybody can right click and just get the data back again, right? So this yeah. ability to recover data and see versions and also see who did it, right? You know, you can look at the list and say, okay, you know, that's Ray again. He's dragged the files out, right? And so you can look at the history and see what happened and when it happened. Yeah. Um, it wasn't you. It wasn't, it wasn't. Oh, I'm sorry, I was just picking a name at random. But, um, so, you know, sending large files, you know, that was a huge, huge issue for all of us. Many services popped up just trying to deal with that one problem alone. Um, but Dropbox then popularized links. They didn't necessarily invent it, but they popularized the use of it. So this is how large files get sent today. Um, and then finally, just ubiquitous syncing and mobile access. You can get all of your files from wherever you happen to be all the time with no need for VPNs or persistent tunnels or anything like that, which again, I think everybody expects now, sort of a baseline for what people expect for file data. So Dropbox invented this new super compelling way of dealing with files. Um, and it's created a huge problem for enterprise, uh, which again, I, I imagine you guys are very familiar with. We got some great, you know, up until this year, we, uh, sorry, last year, we didn't have any really good data to quantify it. We sort of had this, this idea that people in enterprise were just using cloud services. Fortunately, Osterman did some research, and you know, the data they came up with is pretty staggering, showing that almost half of the employees in enterprise today are using Dropbox completely outside the, the realm of the corporate IT. 
which is just a huge problem for corporate IT. And you know, we have a lot of meetings, obviously, with customers. And I'd say this pretty much mirrors my experience. If I go into a, a meeting, it can be a law firm, it can be a medical, you know, some you know companies that have very specific regulation, financial. And I'll be like, you guys, you know, you guys don't use Dropbox, right? And about half the guys in the room will be like, you know, yeah. hell no, there's no way, you know, the panel is too high. And the other people in the room will be like, looking <laughs> at the roof or looking at their fingers, right? Because it's so compelling. Like the corporate system is just far too hard. You know, SharePoint, it's a shared file server, it's a VPN, it's something else, too hard. It's too, you know, they, they want to send a large file, they want to send it right now, they want to do it from their mobile phone. So they just use Dropbox. So, you know, we're at a point where you know, the pain is, uh, is pretty extraordinary. And a lot of very large enterprises we're talking to are in the process of implementing controls. And there are a lot of startups making filters now that the corporation can deploy to try and shut off these cloud services. And there's sort of a battle going on where the filters get more sophisticated. Dropbox, certainly in their own client, they do all sorts of things now for, from a penetration standpoint to try and stay connected in, in, you know, in the face of these filters. And so there's sort of ongoing war between the two things. But the real problem, I think, is that the corporation doesn't have anything to offer those employees. Bringing them back to VPNs, bringing them back to file shares, that just doesn't seem very likely to happen at this point. And so there's this sort of missing ground between the cloud services the employees want to use and the, co the control the corporation absolutely needs to exercise on its data. Um, the other chart here that you'll, you, you may find interesting, and, and there's more data here from, uh, from ESG, if you guys get the chance to look into it, but another thing that we would hear constantly um, you guys will have your own opinion on this because of what you do for a living. But another thing you'd hear, you know, we'd hear constantly in the early days of the company is data centers don't want to manage their own storage. They want to outsource it, right? They just want somebody else to take care of it. Now, I spent the first 15 of my, years of my life working in data centers and helping build data centers. And that didn't particularly jive with my experience. Most CIOs, for obvious reasons, need to control their infrastructure. Almost every cloud service, even the super large ones like Amazon, have had week-long outages in recent history. Almost no corporation could survive that kind of impact of their storage. You've had these file deletions. You know, uh, you know, companies like Dropbox, very sophisticated companies with enormous amounts of capital and human resources, deleting files irrevocably so that you know nobody can recover those files. These are things that most corporations can't deal with. Um, so ESG decided to ask the question. You know, if you for companies already deploying cloud services, file cloud services, so not laggards, not companies that aren't you know that are resisting the cloud. Companies already using those cloud services, and said to them, if you had the chance to run that cloud service out of your own data center and manage it yourself, what would your level of interest be? And shockingly, I think, uh, especially for Silicon Valley, 97% of respondents said that they would be interested in running that cloud service themselves on premise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really staggering, 70% of respondents said that they would be extremely interested in running that cloud service in their own data center if they could. And we don't have it in the deck, but if you look at the ESG report, you'll see the reasons behind, you know, th th this conclusion are exactly what you'd expect. Number one, you know, we want to leverage our own infrastructure investment. And number two, we think we can do a better job of managing what's important to our business than a third party cloud service that's managing a lot of different things can do. There's concerns about regulation, legislation, which is just increasing. The burden is increasing. I was talking to the CIO at a large law firm recently, and he told me that he can't even buy the equipment from anybody that allows him to meet the current legislation that his business is under, and it's a huge problem for them. This just continues to get worse for businesses. So what's going to happen? You've got the users, they want to use Dropbox, they want the features and functionality it offers. You've got corporations that want to control their own storage infrastructure and manage that. And this is sort of the, uh, the world that we came into with Transporter. And our goal with Transporter is to merge these two worlds back together again by giving corporations the tools they need to offer these kinds of file services to the users that they have. So what is Transporter? Well, Transporter reinvents NAS to work like Dropbox. That's, that's effectively what it is, you know, in a nutshell. It's a single sentence pitch for what we do here as a business. So it's private cloud file storage that you buy and own, you deploy and you manage just like you would any other network attached storage system. Yet from the user's perspective, it works just like Dropbox. So it has all of the same characteristics and interface that the users would be familiar with. 
We launched uh, the company uh, about a year and a half ago selling the uh, personal storage device you see on the bottom left. And very, very quickly, uh, we realized that the real market for these devices was large enterprise. Um, we had some of the largest enterprises in America buy quantities of these units and start deploying them around internally, which completely shocked us. This wasn't what we were expecting to happen. We were expecting small law firms, small medical firms to deploy these devices. Um, and, it, and, and very quickly, 20% of all of the devices we sold were going to large enterprise. Um, and a, a larger portion, again, into mid-range enterprise, something like close to half of all the units sold. So it's a big shock for us, and we realized there was an opportunity here, uh, which we followed up on. Um, but through that period, we sold 12,000 transporters. I'll show you where they're deployed in a minute. But uh, So we have a very large global footprint for transporter now, and we're fairly confident the technology works very well. Um, Transport is dramatically less expensive than public cloud file storage. Typically, um, we're, we're cheaper than just 10 months of subscription to Box. So it's cheaper, well, it's much cheaper within a year than you would pay for a cloud storage subscription. Uh, even cheaper than, uh, than sort of lower cost brands like Google uh, in a very short period, which was a surprise to us. It's much higher capacity and much higher performance than public cloud file storage. One of the interesting metrics when you consider how much impact uh, public cloud file storage has had on enterprise storage is when Box filed their S1 and went public, they talked about customer accounts. And to the best of my knowledge, the largest customer account they had, which is also a supplier to them, so it was sort of a circular relationship, was a 20 terabyte deployment. So this was their biggest uh, solution they had. And 20 terabytes is just slightly smaller than the smallest device network appliance sells, to the best of my knowledge. So it shows you the disparity between on-premise storage and cloud storage when the largest cloud storage deployment that we're aware of is smaller than the smallest enterprise device you can buy for network attached storage. So there's this huge gulf between the two worlds still and the amount of data that can be applied to them. And privacy is a huge issue as well. One of the things we want to tackle with our solution is to offer, offer a system that was 100% private and nobody other than the corporation or the only entity had any visibility into the data itself. This is a map of the global footprint of transporters now based on the IP address of the transporters. So, you know, it's not super accurate, but it sort of shows the global distribution. Um, what's interesting to note here is that we only sell transporters uh, in America, England, Germany, and very recently we just started selling them in Japan. So all of the other transporters you see here in South America, Africa, uh, Russia, China, Australia have all been brought in those geographies and relocated to move data backwards and forwards. So at this point, you know, we feel the technology is quite proven. The, the active transport number is over 12,000 now. Um, there's uh, 20 petabytes deployed storage across all of these uh, transports globally. So it's a technology that's definitely had a good chance to mature. And in some ways, you know, these deployments are more hostile than even a corporate environment is. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how it works. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of depth here. There's a, a, a part of our session this afternoon is with our chief architect who can talk a lot better to the details of the technology than I can, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. There's a whole new file system and a new way of dealing with uh, distributed files. Um, but I just want to touch on it sort of a high level, uh, you know, what we've done here as a business from a technology standpoint. So. You know, the, the closest analogy I have to, the, to, to what we're doing versus the existing cloud storage market uh, is what Skype did to the previous internet telephony companies. So if you think back in history, you know, before Skype there were maybe 20 internet telephony companies. You guys will remember that there were 20 internet telephony companies, but I bet you can't name any of them. Like, I bet you'd, have a, you'd, you'd be challenged to name, like, a one of them. And the reason for it was the internet telephony companies basically just copied the same model that the telcos had. So what the internet telephony companies did was that they put servers in the cloud. Every time somebody wanted to call somebody else, they routed the connection through the cloud server and back down to the other client. So there was an inherent cost in routing every single phone call and maintaining every single phone call which wasn't dissimilar from the cost of the telcos. So why it was cool, I guess, to route the calls over the internet instead of routing them over infrastructure, it just wasn't solving the cost part of the problem. And then Skype came along and said, you know, that's crazy. The customer has all the infrastructure they need already. 
Like routing the calls up and down through the internet doesn't make much sense. It's hard to do point-to-point -point connections, and there was a lot of problems that they had to solve at Skype, but that's what they decided to do. And so what Skype provided was a, a control frame in the cloud that basically connected customers directly together. And so the cost of the call was all rooted over the customer's infrastructure, and Skype didn't have to pay for that. And as a result, they could offer telephony initially for free, um, which is the way the service was built. So if you think about the current crop of cloud companies, it's very similar to those early uh, internet telephony providers. The current cloud companies have the files in the cloud. So, you, so let's say you're working on a PowerPoint, you're sharing it with 20 other people in a shared folder. Okay? We've all used you know, Office applications for many years. You get into the sort of almost reflex habit of pressing Control S every 30 seconds, one minute. How, it's not, not rapid enough. And so every time you're doing that, there's one transaction up, typically to Amazon, you know, depending on who the provider hosts with, but for Dropbox it'd be Amazon, which is almost free. That transaction costs almost nothing. Then there's the cost to host the file, which again is pretty reasonable. You know, most backup to the cloud companies are sort of breaking even at this point, and that's pretty. But then it's the downstream transactions where, you know, Amazon really charge, where you retrieve the data. <coughs> and so if you're sharing that file with 20 people, there's one upstream transaction, cost of storing, and then 20 downstream transactions. And then 30 seconds to a minute later, you do the same thing again. It's so one up, 20 down. One up, 20 down. 400 million users all day long. And it explains why there's this just in huge cost in running these cloud businesses today. And remember, even with that huge cost, Amazon's still reportedly losing two to three billion dollars on the back end at the current cost model. Okay? So the economics are pretty poor. And again, this can't continue forever. Like, this has to resolve. Amazon has $9 billion of cash. You can't lose 2 to $3 billion annually on the back of it. Um, you know, Box has, I think, $250 million. You can't lose $200 million forever, right? Like, something has to resolve. So, um, so what we've done at Connected Day is just like what Skype did, sort of, you know, building on the shoulder of giants, I guess. So, the way our service works is we have a control plane in the cloud, uh, which the transporters communicate with and it helps them connect together. The customer buys a transporter, they deploy it on site, um, it connects to our cloud service just long enough to determine where the other transporters are that it needs to connect to. And then the transporters form persistent encrypted tunnels directly between themselves and all of the data is exchanged that way. So this is a one-time connection? No, they connect frequently because the transports could be moving. Transport could be in the back of a vehicle. It could be your phone that you're wandering around with. Mm -hmm. So there's some updating, but it's a DNS kind of transaction. We're like, okay, the transport you're trying to talk to is located here right now, right? And so you can form the connection. Um, once they, again, John will be able to get into the details. I don't know how frequent that is or when it, it needs to retry or form a new connection, but uh, but they will communicate on a reasonably frequent basis. Um, so for the company that, that buys and deploys transports, first off, the key benefit is privacy. Nobody, including connected data, has any visibility into the data stored on those transports. Any, you know, government can come see us, they can ask us files, we don't have them. But the files are, are completely stored on the customer side, on the transports that are stored there, so it's 100% private. Second benefit for the customer is locality. If all your transports are located in Canada, your data is all in Canada and it's nowhere else. So you know exactly where the data is being kept and maintained. You can meet whatever legislation you have to under the, uh, under the local laws there. Having on-site storage means it's super fast. You can use your gigabit connections. You can access at the same speed you can with NAS. You can have a much larger data set. Um, and you can replicate the data to as many sites as you want and have high-speed access on all of those locations as well. So it's not even like uh, you know, one of these large object store deployments where you're pulling data from the object store across your own infrastructure. You can just deploy the data to wherever you want it to be. So lots of customer benefits. And then on the connected data side of things, you know, the core benefit is even though we have 20 petabytes of storage deployed and 35,000 active users every day, the service costs close to nothing to run because we're not ruining any data. We're not paying for any of those transactions like the other cloud storage companies are. So in our mind, you know, this is an economic model that can actually work for cloud storage moving forward versus the current model. So if I'm doing, <coughs> if I'm sharing some set of files with 20 other people, yes then my transporter transmits that data 20 times over my ridiculously slow uplink because I live in New Mexico. Well, the other, who are the other, it depends who the other 20 people are, right? These guys. So if everybody's got a transporter, 
right. and it's a mesh. So you won't be transmitting the file necessarily 20 times. The file could get pulled from any other part of the mesh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's a multi-level replication. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, maybe you only transmit it once. Right. The transport connect... The, so, the, again, John will talk to you in more detail about this. But the tra the trans the, the all the client software constantly tracks the fastest route to any given data that, that they have permission to access. So you know if you move between offices or transport goes offline, right? Or the if client I share with these guys, it's going to go to Europe once and then amongst exactly. Arian and Enrico and Jan. That's exactly right. Okay, that's exactly right. Because it sounded like it was a mismatch with the asymmetry of low end internet. No, no. Okay. But again, you know, a core focus here, you know, with the new set of products is businesses, you know, and that's much more symmetrical. Yeah, absolutely. So there's no ma there's no maximum number of transporter nodes. You could have thousand transporter nodes on a single shared structure cluster. I don't even know what the terminology is. John might know. We we don't know. We've tested up to a hundred nodes, okay. which seems like a you know pretty sizable deployment. Certainly much larger than anything we have yeah. deployed currently. And it works just great. Um, there we have corporate customers, we saw 30, 40 nodes communicating. And, and the control plane is connected data is control or, or or is that something also distributed out to the, the various transporters or uh, no so the control plane is hosted at Amazon. So it's, oh, it's, a, it's 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 effectively connected data s uh, service. That yes, that's right. And it's like a, it works just like a DNS service. So it helps the transports find each other and form um, connections. If I am in a big enterprise and I want it a private uh, connected data service, can I have a hit for me? For the right enterprise, we could certainly do that. <laughs> 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 the um, so we have e even though. You know, for a for a current default model, we have you know a single instance on Amazon. It's just a Lin it's just Linux servers, and so we have separate instances running QA, and we have separate instances running in support. So we've already duplicated the instances, and in fact, the transporter software is designed such that when a transport comes online, it's like I'm a QA transport. I'm going to go talk to this service. I mean, you know, I'm a you know I'm a regular transport. It's I'm like talk configuration to this or something like that. Exactly. So so it, we've designed it with that in mind, and we think that for larger enterprise. That will that will be a requirement for many larger enterprises. And I didn't understand. So if I have uh, all my folks here with a transporter and we share a one terabyte directory, it is replicated all the times. So uh, so I have a uh, twelve. Uh, terabyte at the end of the day. Well, it, it, it you know, it depends on what you're what you're doing, right? So if you're in an enterprise and the file's hosted on a transport and you have 12 users sharing it, it's only stored once. It doesn't get created 12 times in everybody's home directory. It's single instance storage on the transport okay. itself. If you're 12 different enterprises and you share a folder, then yes, it will get replicated once to each enterprise. Yeah. So it, so it you know, so out you know, outside the corporation, yes, if you share it'll get replicated again. Inside the corporation, it's totally up to the administrator. And one of the nice things about the transport, so we have transport desktop software, it's just like you know the Dropbox client. What's really nice about it as well is it hides, it sort of abstracts that. So as an administrator, I might have this transport with these shared folders on it, and this transport with these shared folders, and this transport with these shared folders. To the user, it just looks like one file tree. So it's all abstracted for the user. And even if I take the data off of one transport, you know, I, d I remove it, it'll just fall over in real time on the client, you know, subdirectory level to the new transport providing it. It's really pretty cool. Again, you know, John will talk to the details on that, but uh, it's all completely abstract, and the administrator has fine-grained control over what data lives where. And it can be encrypted on the transporters, or uh, that's coming soon. That's prob I, I think we have a roadmap session. We'll talk to you about that. But it's a common request, uh, principally for HIPAA compliance, and so it's something that we've been working on, and we expect to deliver shortly. The, the, all the data transmission is encrypted currently. Yeah, EST five six, I think. <laughs> So the other thing, before I get into the business transport specifically, the other thing I sort of want to just highlight is because it looks like a NAS box, you know, people inherently sort of, uh, you know, assign attributes of NAS to it. Um, but the one thing I sort of just wanted to emphasize on this slide is it does everything a cloud service does. So you don't sacrifice anything. You know, one of the challenges we've got, I did a talk at SNEA uh, last year. And one of the challenges I talked about there was that um, Dropbox really invented a whole new way of interacting with files that isn't the cloud. Like it's like a whole new set of protocols, like SIFs or NFS or something. Like it's a whole new protocol stack almost, but it doesn't have a name. 
like there's no name for it there's no name for that approach and so as a consequence people just think of it as the cloud but we've completely disaggregated that implementation from the cloud itself and we have it on a hardware system but there's no reason at all why you sacrifice anything we have a full third party api which third party developers use just like a any other cloud service would you can sync from the coffee shop you can access files from your mobile phone wherever you happen to be you can search you can create links all of the things you expect from a cloud service are exactly the same on our system. But you can actually transport the transporter if you wanted to bring it along with you to various locations? Yeah, if you want. We had some journalists uh, last year, I think it was, who took one to an event because they were taking a lot of video footage. Yeah. And what's nice about transporters is it's always on, right? So the problem they were experiencing, they were using Dropbox previously, the problem they were experiencing was their laptop just had to sit there on the hotel Wi-Fi for like hours yeah, uploading the video. Yeah, yeah. And so what they did was they, they brought a little hub, they plugged the transporter into the hub, so they could just upload to the transporter, which took no time at all, right? Mm. Close and go, and then the transport's sitting there drip feeding the information out over the internet connection 24 by seven, right? right? And so it's really nice because again, your transactions with the transports are local, so they're very fast, and then the transport's just always on transmitting data for you. And again, you need an on-premise appliance to do that, of course. Now what protocol does the PC use to talk to the transporter? What protocols can it use? Uh, it's a, it, we have our own connection protocol okay. that supports all the failover and so everything. A client. Yes, absolutely. So, the, so we have clients for Windows, Mac, uh, iOS, and Android, um, which all form connections to the transporters. There's a whole API which worries about the failover and connectivity. It monitors the speed of connections and uses the high speed connection for any particular request. It's a pretty sophisticated stack at this point. Jeff? Yeah. You, you've got the sync part covered. How do you do the share? Uh, just like you would with Dropbox, you right click, you select other users you want to share with. But they, but they have to be other transporter users. With no, Drop no, they, with they don't actually. You can. Uh, so I have to open a hole in my firewall so they can come get the file when I give them a public URL. Uh, in fact, you don't. Um, but you might choose to. If you opened a hole in your firewall, it'd be faster. Um, we have all sorts of mechanisms we can use to form connections. Most of which were pioneered by Skype, uh, who sort of pioneered this approach. But um, So I can create a public URL, and if I don't have a hole in my firewall, you'll proxy it and act as a connection broker? Right. There's, okay. there's all sorts of, you've got all sorts of choices. So you could send a link, right? And we have two types of links. You can send a link where it gets uploaded to the cloud and they just download it if it's something that's not secure. We have a type of link where they install, they use a client to go get the file directly from your transport, so it's never hosted outside the organization for more secure information. Mm -hmm. um, they can install the desktop client, and you, when you share the folder, you can say, hey, they can keep a local copy of this, and then it'll sync with their desktop machine, use your transporter as a piggyback, they'll piggyback on your transporter. So there's all sorts of mechanisms. <coughs> that If they're a transport owner, it'll make a copy to their transporter. There's all sorts of ways to share, depending on who it is you want to share with and what kind of facility you want to provide to them. Okay. So is there authentication and audit on that kind of stuff yet? Uh, the audit's just getting completed, so that's this close to getting released now. Um, and uh, there's full authentication, of course, yeah. yeah. And, and can you tie into my LDAP or Active Directory, or am I defining users on the transporter? Uh, so this is something we're working on. We have an Active Directory connector. Um, uh, which is a you know a first step in integrating with Active Directory, so you don't have to create all the accounts again, you don't have to create all the groups again, and so forth. It'll sort of keep those things in sync. But there's more work we can do okay. as we get further and further into business. So we can improve that, I think. But we've got we, we at least have an Active but, Directory. But you're connected. on the road. You're on the road. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So what we launched at the beginning of this year was Transporter for Business. Um, so, you know, we released our first business class transporters designed specifically for enterprise. And, you know, the way we describe these things, uh, you know, at a high level, is it's like network appliance and Dropbox came along and had a baby, right? So it's all that NAS goodness that uh, you find from, na you know, the, the, the IT guys love, the ability to deploy it, the ability to know where the data is, the complete control, the ability to back it up to tape or optical or whatever the corporate guideline is or regulation is there. But for the users, it's that Dropbox experience that they're completely addicted to at this point. And our goal with this product is to marry those two, two camps back together again. We believe that the users who are using Dropbox are using it because it's so much more convenient than the corporate systems. But given a corporate system that's as convenient, they would choose to be good corporate citizens. The IT guys love it because again, they have all the control they need and the ability to audit and the ability to go and recover files, the ability to back up, which shockingly you can't do with any of the cloud services currently. They like just can't. 
and you know many corporations have strict policies around backup that they're audited against so they have to be able to back up this data it's one of the big problems with the the cloud uh, proliferation in enterprise now do you mean i can back it up with my own backup software or you have a backup mechanism you can back it up we provide we provide basically a surf space mechanism for you so anything that can read files any backup which is almost all of the main packages right. can back it up so you can put it on whatever you want All right, so you know we see transport for business as you know this is this is where I get controversial, I suppose. But again, it wouldn't it wouldn't be us if we weren't a little bit controversial, right? So we see transporter for business as really the next evolution of network attached storage. We see that the users have already moved on. The users already passed you know SIFs and NFS for file for unstructured file data. They've already gone. They they know what they want. They know how they want to access it. But the corporation still needs this control. Transporter for Business brings a whole bunch of things to corporate network attached storage that has just been very hard for it to do before. First of all, it scales seamlessly. If you need more users, you need more uh, capacity, uh, you need more scale, you can just rack up transporters. And because of the way our file system works in an asynchronous manner, the users can just load balance across these transporters. And even though it's scaling, there's no need for a high-speed backplane, there's no need for you know, tight coupling like you would normally find in a sort of scale-up system. You just don't need them the way our file system works. If you've got branch offices, you've got more locations, you can just deploy transports to all of those locations. And in a single pane of glass management, you can just choose what data gets replicated where. So these users can be getting gigabit access to the data here, and these users up here can be getting gigabit access to the same data set up here in the branch office. Could be in another continent. It's just fine. And again, this n-way replication is something that's been very hard to achieve with traditional NAS appliances, but it's baked into the file system, our file system, sort of at the ground level. For remote users, they don't need any infrastructure at all. You can just install the client on their machines. They can sync back to the enterprise. You know, if they happen to be close to this office, they'll sync here. If they happen to be close to this office, they'll sync there. They'll just find the fastest route. Uh, home workers, again, they can just install the software if you wanted. You could deploy smaller devices in place of the sort of always on VPN routers you might have had in those locations and cache local data. Like the journalist example we were talking about earlier, if you have somebody working on large architectural drawings or you need like a large cached working data set, it's great because they're replicating 24 by 7, so the data is always there and always replicate exactly when they need to use it. And those devices go all the way to two terabytes in just a small cone. So again, you can store an enormous amount of data on those. Uh, certainly the working set for almost any class of, uh, of person. Um, now what if I don't want them to have my data anymore? Can I unsync it? Yes, you can just turn it off and it will get removed. Well, let's say they have their own, right? I, me and Christopher are sharing. I don't like Christopher anymore. Yes. I don't want him to have my data. Yes. That happens a lot, surprisingly. <laughs> right. More than you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you can so that 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 you can do a certain amount, right? So we have the ability for you to kill folders or remove folders, or the ability for you to kill mobile devices. You know, if they get lost or stolen, just the same as you can with an iPhone. I mean, one of the issues with file data, you know, which I'll be upfront about, which is the same for Dropbox, Box, and Rebuilds, you can always copy it somewhere. For you absolute into, security, you need thermite. You can yeah, exactly. You can read it into Word and you can save it out in a flash deck, right? That's files. And you know that's baked in at the operating system layer, but all of the controls that the other services have, we have too. So we're on a par with uh, you know the other players in the space. All right, and uh, you know finally, just wrapping up, you know just to re-emphasize that the user gets the Dropbox experience. So that 43% of guys who are off the reservation currently, they can have exactly the same experience now on the corporate system that currently they're having to go to a cloud service to use. So with that. Hopefully I'm more or less on schedule. Uh, that's sort of introduction of what we're doing here at Connected Data and the transporter product itself. Uh, Jim, you'll talk about the lineup of products, right? Sure. Okay, great. So I don't know if you guys have got any other questions for me. If not, I'll, uh, I'll hang out and uh, I'll be around for the rest of the session. Since you're talking about sync and share, one of the problems is people accessing the same file at the same time. A lot of the other providers, they don't do hidden files. For example, you open up an Office document. Therefore, me and Christopher are collaborating. We're you know, contending for that same document. Right. Have you solved that problem? <clears throat> Uh, well, it's a hard problem to solve. Right. <laughs> so uh, we're at least as good as everybody else 
um, and we have similar mechanisms to deal with these things. We're careful about what gets replicated and what gets doesn't, so you don't get into sort of contention around temporary files and things. But ultimately, if you, ex if you edit Word document at the same time I edit Word document, you save it and I save it. What we do is you can right click on any document or any folder and you can see a complete history for the folder, including other versions of the files. So what will happen in that case is, you know, one of us will win out, that will be the file, and the other file will be in the version history. And so we can then just create a second copy of that if we want, or roll back to that one. So we have the same sort of controls that other folks do around versioning. What, what's nice about our versioning versus NAS systems, certainly this is a benefit that the cloud services all have, but what's nice about our versioning versus, the cloud, uh, versus, versus NAS, typically on NAS you have a snapshot that's local to the device, but for us we replicate the version history with the shared folders. So all of the version history and auditing is available on, you know, from any client on any device. So whether the versions were created in this office, you know, or this office, the history is a unified history and accessible wherever you happen. Are you to replicating be. all the versions? Or <coughs> the we replicate the history, and then they'll pull versions from wherever they happen Get to be available data. from. Yeah. yeah. But if it's a NAS file system, and you know, we're using Office, Office handles the locking. That'll prevent us from collaborating. Yeah, that's with true. That. That's absolutely right. All right. Thanks very much. I'll hand over to Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Jeff. Thank you.